Okay, I, I think we should get started. Just uh, run too late. Um, so we're very happy to have uh, Cesar Argon, who's going to tell us about the allowed entry functions in CFTs. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, let me start by thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk in this nice conference. And second, let me apologize for. Uh, uh, giving a talk on a topic that doesn't seem to be so connected with the theme of the of the workshop, even though I hope at the end you will see some kind of connection or some uh, so, some interest in this particular problem. Uh, in particular, I think I could have just called the presentation like reconstructing the CFT from entanglement measures, and that would be like more affine, more affine. Sorry. Okay. So uh, today I will be talking mainly based on this first paper. And uh, maybe you know, if there is some extra time, I may just say a few words about the, the other paper. And these two words are were made in collaboration with Paulo Bueno, who is right now at CERN, but I think recently he moved to Barcelona. And then also with Horacio Cassini, who is at Instituto of Alcero, uh, like myself. Okay, so uh, just a, uh, a quick summary. I will be talking, I mean, the, the, the overall motivation will be precisely what I just said uh, a few seconds ago is that uh, whether you can have a description of the CFT just based on entanglement entropy or related quantities and how complete could that description be. And in particular, in asking this question, then uh, we happen to find ourselves with this model, which was discovered some time ago. And then uh, I will try to motivate why this model is interesting and try to see whether uh, we can learn something from it. And just uh, give some summary and some future work. Okay, so the, motiva the motivation is basically uh, based on this uh, Wyman reconstruction theorem, that is axiomatic version of QFT, in which uh, in, in, this, in this prescription, like the basic objects that people study are correlation functions of field operators in the ground state of the theory. And then there is this nice uh, reconstruction theorem that says that if you, if, if you have a set of correlators that satisfy a set of, a complete set of axioms, then the set of correlators will define for you a, uh, particular quantum field theory. Then uh, you, you, might, you may wonder if something similar to this can be, uh, can be done, for instance, using entropy functions. And the most natural context in which this could be possible is, for instance, in the algebra QFT description of quantum field theory. The reason is because uh, in, this, in this description, the basic objects are like causal regions associated to special, like causally complete regions associated to space-like regions. And, and, and the natural objects that people study are like measures of correlations of, of uh, associated to those regions. Or, I mean, the, the basic things people study are just relations between algebras associated to those open, open regions, uh, or closed regions, sorry. Okay, uh, and one such object, of course, is the entanglement entropy, but in, as people have said here multiple times, entanglement entropy is not well defined. So the most natural thing to next to consider is just the mutual information associated to pairs of, of, of cautiously complete regions like the ones I'm, I'm drawing here. So th that, that's kind of the motivation. Uh, and, uh, and now I will try to show you at least what I think is an example of this idea of reconstructing the CFT from correlators, sorry, the QFT from correlators. And, and, and to me, it seems like in the CFT, this idea is very precise because as, as, as you may know, uh, Usually, a complete description of a CFT is just given in terms of a complete set of scaling and spins of the primary operators that lives in that theory, and also a rule of how to uh, uh, to consider products of operators or the so-called OP or the OP coefficients in the theory. So basically, a CFT is defined by this set of, of quantities, and uh, and then you can imagine that if somebody solves all the axiomatic uh, properties that a CFT should satisfy, then you only need to read off these numbers from the two and the three point functions. And of course, what, what I mean that, that somebody solves for you, that it, what I meant explicitly is that all the higher correlation functions satisfy the unitarity constraints or the, like this kind of uh, crossing symmetry, et cetera, et cetera, that will just put constraints over these OP coefficients. So what I mean by that, that somebody already give you good OP coefficients. Okay. Uh, now, in this context, uh, I, I wrote down explicitly this formula because it will be important for, for us later on. And it's just this fact that this four point function has a natural expansion in terms of what is called conformal blocks. And the conformal blocks uh, essentially give you the contribution of intermediate operators, which take into account the primary operator that appears here in this channel, as well as all their descendants. 
So later on, this thing will appear. So I just wanted to remind you what these objects are. And, and these objects, uh, I mean, this four point function is defined based on four, on, on four space time points. And so this is also will be important later on. Okay, but we're talking about entanglement entropies and entanglement functions. And I said that since the entanglement entropy is divergent, uh, we will just gonna use uh, the mutual information. Okay, the entanglement entropy that I'm gonna be interested here, like, like with, uh, in analogy with the, with the Wyman, with the Wyman reconstruction theorem, would be the entanglement entropy for the ground state of the, of, uh, of this, of the theory. And uh, okay, this is the usual definition and we are going to consider this. Uh, more explicitly, uh, the kind of uh, situation that we have in mind is this, in which we have two disjoint regions. They don't have to be spheres, it can be anything else. Okay, uh, one of the interesting things about the mutual information is that it essentially uh, keep many of the nice features of the entanglement entropy. And indeed, you can even uh, uh, interpret the mutual information as a natural regularization from the entropy. So uh, this regularization, you can see it in this picture. Like if you consider like the, the, the two regions are A and the complement of A, which is which you obtain by moving the boundary a small amount epsilon, then the mutual information between these two will give you like a regularized version of the, of the mutual information. So for example, the properties that we know that the mutual information satisfy for the ground state will be positivity, which comes from subadditivity of the entanglement entropy. Uh, there is also this monotonicity, which basically just tells us that if we increase one of the regions, uh, then the mutual information necessarily has to increase. Uh, just, uh, and, and, it, and it goes hand by hand with the, with the mean of mutual information as a measure of correlations. This comes from strong subadditivity. And since we are gonna be focusing on the ground state, then we're going to impose also Lorentz invariance. Uh, since we are talking about uh, QFTs, there, there is also this property of clustering that it just, if you put the regions fall sufficiently far away, then the mutual information should go to, should go to zero. Uh, the mutual information for this particular case, which is the, the regularized version of the entanglement entropy, should also satisfy some area law. Where uh, the, the additional interesting feature that the mutual information has is that the coefficient that appear here for the area law divergence, let's say, where epsilon is just the distance between the surfaces, will be universal. Now, uh, I, I mentioned the CFT, and this was also another, another part of motivation, because uh, I believe it, it, it will be very hard to to, to make any progress in this reconstruction program, unless you consider sufficiently simple theories. And as you see, like this, uh, this reconstruction idea, at least for CFTs was very straightforward. So maybe you can imagine that for, for CFTs, you could also have, have made some progress. So I'm going to focus here also just for the conformally invariant theories, and thus we also impose this constraint. Okay, so the idea is the following. Uh, we have two abstract space, let's say the, the space of functionals that depends on like functionals that depends on the region, of course, but it, it, it is defined regardless of the region, uh, we satisfy all the set of axioms or the properties that I mentioned to you before. And there is this other uh, set of conformal invariant theories, let's say. And so uh, there is a simple relation that the mutual information gives the, the, the definition from the QFT side that given any CFT, you will immediately get a functional, which is just the mutual information, that's by definition. So what we are interested here is in exploring the possibility that if you are able to solve for a particular realization of this functional, then this functional will actually correspond to a particular CFT. So if you have like a map from CFTs to functionals of mutual information. But of course, uh, finding explicit realizations of functional that satisfy all these properties, like study this problem seems like very out of reach at least. So far, yeah. The, the mutual information is unitary invariant, right? Like, isn't, how do you uniquely fix a theory given these, can't you have like two theories which differ by local unitaries or something? Uh, you mean local unitaries in the regions yeah, that you yeah. pick? The point is that I'm, I'm talking about arbitrary regions. Oh, this is regions. like for all regions we have to avoid. So this is, this is what makes this very highly non-trivial. Okay. In, in vacuum or in all states? Sorry? In the vacuum, in the vacuum. For arbitrary regions, but in the vacuum. I'm, I'm just... It's just two regions. Uh, region. Yeah, yeah, but each region can be made out of multiple uh, disconnected pieces. Yeah. So it's like the completely general setup. Yes. That's at least the, the idea we have in mind. Okay. So do we have instances of this kind of, of, of situations? And uh, 
I would like to claim that yes, that we have like particular solutions. Like we know that the Rita Kajanagi formula, and uh, since we are talking about mutual information when combining this form, obeys all the actions that we expect that a uh, mutual information should obey. So you may imagine uh, discovering the mutual information, uh, sorry, the, the Rita Kajanagi formula just by trying to solve for all the constraints. If we additionally impose the constraints that people have been discovering over the years. Like maybe there is a program in which if you impose all these inequalities, all these constraints that I mentioned to you, plus all the holographic entropy cone inequalities, then you will discover that there is a, some geometric uh, extra dimension. I mean, so some geometric way of interpreting this formula in which you use the Rita Kajanagi prescription. Let's say so that would be. Yeah. So isn't that true in any state? Uh, yeah. I mean, this this is true in any state, but then you will have to restrict to the ground state if if, if we want to go with this philosophy. No, but I'm saying. I mean, the, the, the so point. Could, yeah, I mean, you could. Uh, I'm just saying, there's more than one solution to the, to the problem of holographic entropy uh, Yeah, 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 yes. I mean, this gives gives you like solutions for arbitrary states, but also is it's true that this this entropy it doesn't obey all the properties that I mentioned. Like, it's not it's not Lorentz invariant or conformal invariant. So those are the the ones that will single out the, the ground state. Okay, so this is interesting. Now, uh, you, you, just to uh, produce actual so okay so, so to summarize what, what i'm kind of saying here is that it seems useful to impose additional constraints because if, if we know the, the the fact that uh, the rita kajanagi formula has such a nice functional form and like a very concrete expression is because it's, it's away a bunch of additional inequalities so maybe it's a good idea in order to track this problem in the more general case just to try to find particular solutions that you obtain when you impose additional constraints so i would like to motivate that similar to monogamy, which is this inequality between the mutual information of adjoined regions and, and their individual mutual informations, like I, I here put B, B union C and here B and C, then uh, maybe motivated by this, you could have come up with the property that is called extensivity. What is extensivity? Just uh, propose or just to restrict to the kind of theories that will obey this property, that the mutual information of A with B union C is just the sum of the mutual of the individual mutual informations. So no, none of the uh, previously mentioned properties for, for, forbid us to doing that. So maybe this will help us to find a particular solution. And this was actually the problem that was solved by Cassini and Huerta in 2008. And this was uh, called the extensive model for, for the mutual information. So what they propose is that, okay, let's look at uh, particular instantiations of mutual or functionals for mutual information that satisfy this property. And what I found rather surprising is that they actually single out a, uh, a particular solution, which is extremely explicit. And this is uh, what I call extensive mutual information model in this talk. Okay, uh, let, me, let me go a little bit up because this, this formula might be more natural or more simple. So you can see that the extensive, the, the mutual information model, of course, is, uh, is extensive in each of the regions. You have, it involves integrals over, the, over any Cauchy surface that has, has the same boundary that defines the region A and B, and it and it comes with this double integral and a kernel that correlates the two. So this is a current current correlator, if you want. Uh, these n are just the normals to each point in this in the surface that you choose, and indeed, just uh, using property the the, per, the previous properties, then you can deduce that actually this current has to be conserved, and that the scaling dimensions of this operator is actually equal to d minus one, if if, if if you want. So. So this is completely explicit. Uh, and let me go back to the previous formula. So this, this formula is just a, uh, an alternative uh, representation in which this integral collapses just to a boundary integral, but it's, it's kind of similar. And you see immediately the dependence with the distance. Okay, these formulas will be important for us. So going back to the philosophy that I'm trying to sell, uh, to, to, to mention here or to, or to describe here. Uh, so the question is, does this model correspond to a particular CFT or not? And this question was actually answered back in, in this same paper that it does corresponds to a particular CFT at least in two dimensions. And that CFT is just the free fermion field theory. Okay. Uh, you can see immediately the extensivity of that. I mean, this is more or less straightforward to go from here to here. But then this fixes, and, and of course, all the properties that I have been mentioned uh, doesn't fix the normalization of this of this quantity. So there is like a free parameter here, but then if you want to relate it to the free fermion, then we'll just fix completely this parameter and the solution is, is completely fixed. Okay, so the question that we would like to answer here 
is whether there exists a CFT such that this model represents the mutual information for any arbitrary regions. And, uh, and I will try to, to motivate that. First of all, uh, a natural guess is that, okay, we already mentioned that in D equal to the, 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 the model is the free fermion. So maybe, maybe it's very easy to guess the answer. Maybe it's also free fermion in arbitrary dimensions. But this was already discussed again in the original paper. And the answer is uh, unfortunately no. Uh, the way to do that is, 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 is just to compare the various central charges that you can derive from the, from the free theory formula, for instance, for the entanglement entropy. This is well known. You can put it in the computer and you can compute uh, entropies for various regions. In particular, uh, to, to make the comparison more natural, something that is, uh, that is convenient to compute is just the, the mutual information for this regularized version of the entanglement entropy because then you can read uh, the various uh, universal coefficients. Uh, like for example here, the, as I said at the beginning, this area low divergence is, is, is a universal coefficient that, the, that depends only on, C, on the CFT and the A anomaly or the F anomaly of the, of the CFT will also be computed from, for even dimensions from the coefficient in the log divergence of, of the log term of the, of, the, of the mutual information and from odd dimensions from the constant piece that you can extract from the, from the mutual information. Then since, as I, as I told you before, there is an overall factor to be normalized, then you might just compare ratios between these universal coefficients for the model that I'm describing for you, the EMI, and also from the free fermion. And then when we do this comparison, what you find is that those ratios do not correspond to the ones of the EMI, then it cannot be the EMI. So the argument is very simple. <clears throat> However, uh, I, I think it's kind of surprising that the difference between these ratios is actually not that big as you could have imagined. So for example, in D equal three, if you compute this coefficient, uh, in D equal three, you have to compute this coefficient and you get that they differ just by about 3%. In D equal four, the difference starts to increase. It's nine point something percent, the difference between these ratios and so on. And then when you increase the dimension, the difference starts growing. Okay, but there are some other checks. For example, in D equal four, uh, using Solodukin's formula, you can also compute for this model, the ratio between the A term and the central charge of the theory. And it turns out that the, for the EMI, you get two thirds. For the free fermion, you get this number. And what I found surprising is that this, the number that you find for the EMI actually obeys the unitarity bounds, which in principle we didn't put it uh, to begin with. So it seems that, uh, and in general, there are, I mean, people have been studying this model because it gives you physical reasonable results for different situations. So they can even, even get some insights into what to expect in uh, generic mutual information. So this model seems to be very interesting and describing some things that are consistent with physics, at least uh, so far. Okay, uh, but, that doesn't mean, but that doesn't mean that there is anything wrong with the EMI. That just means that our guess was wrong. It just the conclusion is that it is not a free fermion in higher dimensions. So what can we do for, for to be able to describe what, the CF, what is the CFT associated to this model? Okay. Uh, to keep on with that, I will have to go back a little bit and review some, some results for uh, some, some previous results of mutual information. Uh, first, let me just recall this bound, uh, which I found very interesting. The mutual information bounds the connected correlators of bounded operators that you can define on the regions that you, whose mutual information you are computed. Um, and so I, I found interesting that actually, if you just naively plug into this inequality, the, an operator, like a primary operator of a CFT, let's say if you apply this inequality for a CFT and you just plug in a, an arbitrary primary operator, then what you get is that the mutual information bounds the, the, the square of a two point function. Oh, okay, this is wrong, this should be four. The square of a, of a, of a two point function is like parametrically is bounded below by up to some coefficient times this function. Okay, uh, and just because of that, then if we want to get close to the mutual information, then what we, what we need to do is to, is, is to consider the, the, the primary operator whose two point function is as big as possible. And that at least at long distances will correspond to the one who has the smallest primary uh, scaling, primary, uh, scaling dimension. Okay, so, so, so this, we find then that this is like an efficient inequality or an efficient bound. Uh, in 2013, Cardi actually shows us that at long distances, indeed, the mutual information is precisely given by this, or it has this functional dependence at long distance. It goes exactly like the distance to the, or like the square of the, the two point function of the primary operator of lowest scaling dimension of the theory, with some coefficient that you can determine in some cases explicitly doing some replica calculations. 
later on, uh, we were able to find a coefficient for the case of spheres. This, this argument is completely general, uh, which generalizes previous work by Tony Cardi Calabresi, who doesn't know. Okay, uh, so, so this is, uh, these are just some in interesting results that I'm going to use. Um, and this, all of you know very well, this replica trick uh, method to compute the entanglement entropy for a particular region. Uh, so let me just say that the idea is that you just make uh, n copies of the, of the space time and also the field theories, and then you identify cyclically when you rotate around the region A, let's say. And there is a, 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 better, pres uh, a better way of interpreting this calculation in which you just use a single space time, but then you just consider uh, n copies of the CFT and you use this uh, cyclic identification when you rotate around the boundary of the region whose entropy you are computing. And so uh, this, I'm, I'm just reviewing this because I want to relate the trace of rho to the n to just the expectation value of this operator, which is the twist operator. And this object is defined in n copies of the original CFT, okay? Now for us, it would be convenient to separate this uh, expectation value of the twist operator, oh no, sorry, the twist operator itself in the piece that is proportional to the identity and the rest of the, of, of, of the twist operator, I've just called it uh, the tilde, which is normalized with respect to this expectation value. And, uh, and then just plugging in in the formula for the mutual information or the Rennie mutual information and getting and taking the end going to one limit, then you get this nice formula for the mutual information. All this I'm just saying so that, to see, to, so that you can see more or less explicitly how the mutual information is actually related to some sort of correlation function. Uh, is just the correlation function of these twist operators, okay? And we are going to compute this uh, in, certain, in certain cases, okay? Um, this is the same. So let me now review the proposal uh, by Cardi. So Cardi essentially tells us that uh, if you look at far away from the location of the twist operator, then you, you can uh, expand the twist operator in terms of a complete basis of operators in, in your replicated theory. So all these guys live in the end copies of the CFT. I'm, I'm just constrained, I'm, I'm just focusing on CFTs, but you can actually write down this in, in some generality. With some coefficients and, and, and these operators are primaries of the replica, of, of the replica theory. Um, and, and if you propose this sort of expansion, which is valid if you look at observables far away from the location of the region, then uh, it naturally comes with some kind of order. And this order is also, uh, it, it, it is basically related to the fact that the correlation function of these operators is, it will also decay with the scaling dimensions of the associated, oper of the associated primaries, no? Because, uh, and the mutual information is related to that, then it, it gives you like a way to organize your expansion. So, you just, um, and, and in this way of organizing, you, also, you can also include like for example, the type of operators that only involve one copy of the CFT at a time, like this one, or, or operators that involves two copies and so on. So you, you can organize it in this form and also from a smallest scaling dimension to largest scaling dimension and so on. So in general, this is a very complicated expansion, but if you only care to characterize the mutual information at long distances and try to extract some physics from it, then there is, a, as I said, it's a natural organization. Uh, one, one thing that happens is that these type of operators do not contribute to the end going to one limit, at least not a leading order. Um, and so we just keep at, at the lowest order, the, the type of operators that involve two copies of the CFT. Uh, now, if we, could, if, we, if we just keep the leading term, then we can extract the coefficient just by considering a correlation function of these two operators and two test operators far away from the region, okay? It, it, it is very easy to go from here to here. And then you can see that that this coefficient can be obtained if you study the correlation function. Sorry, if you study the correlation functions of these primary operators in the presence of this twist operator, everything here is in the replica, in this replica abstract replica or multi-copy CFT. And finally, just by plugging this formula back into the definition, you get this type of expansion, which is, which is, which, uh, which is what uh, what Cardi told us. Okay, but, uh, but today I'm interested in this, in, in, this, uh, in this correlator because now I would like to present a formula that was recently uh, developed by, by Cassini, Testé, and Toroba, which I found which is extremely interesting. Uh, so, but these people basically told us uh, how to compute this type of correlator for arbitrary regions A, and actually how to compute the coefficient that appears in the mutual information for 
for any arbitrary operator of this, of this type, for any, the contribution of any primary operator of this one. Uh, and, and the basic formula is this one. So you can rewrite this in terms of like the trace of powers of the reduced density operator with some insertions of the operator that you are interested in. So this formula, one feature that it has is that you immediately eliminate at least explicitly the, the dependence on the, on, on the replicas that you are considering. So you have just an op a normal operator, another normal operator, but with some insertions of powers of the density operator. And in particular, when you go to the end going to one limit, then this correlator reduces um, in, some, in some form to the correlation function of just ordinary operators, where one of them has been evolved modularly by some imaginary, by some a small imaginary piece. Uh, so this is the model evolution. That's why I'm, I'm introducing the dependence on the region. And, and so basically, if you know how to compute the correlation function of an operator and, and itself, but after some modular evolution, then you will have uh, done basically most of the job in order to, to, to determine the coefficients that, I'm, that I need to compute the mutual information. Okay, so the, the, but, but you still need to do some sum, et cetera, and you take the end going to one limit. So this might be complicated, but, uh, but these people did explicitly and then they just write down formulas in terms of integrals of certain kernel that involves products of these two point functions that I mentioned before. So this is the basic formula. <clears throat> so in other, in other words, you can know how the mutual information depends on the geometry of the region that you are considering in the, in the strict limit in which you put the regions far away from each other just by doing this type of computation. And this type of computation does not involve replicas or anything like that. Okay, of course, doing this is very complicated because this is, uh, this is a non-local uh, evolution and, uh, and, and it is not known explicitly how to compute this, this, this operator or these correlators. But in the particular case of spheres, then we know exactly how to do it. And, and, and these people did it for spheres and they generalize, I mean, they reproduce previous, previous results like the one I mentioned at the beginning, the mutual information for, uh, I, didn't, I didn't set it, but this mutual information is under the assumption that the lowest scaling dimensional operator is a scalar. And then you can find this coefficient that I mentioned before, this is uh, work uh, 2015. Um, uh, and, and, they, and they reproduce it using this method. So, which is a, a, a useful check, but they also did it not just for spheres lying on the same hyperplane, but they actually did it in full generality. So you're considering spheres that can be, that, that, that can lie on, on independent hyperplanes, like space-like hyperplanes. So, and, this, and the dependence on the normals of these hyperplanes will be very important because that will tell us something about the spin of the operator. So for example, for the spinner, they, they found this coefficient, sorry, I don't know. There, there is like a echo or something. Okay, so for example, for a spinner, they get this explicit formula, which give rise to, a, to an interesting signature at the level of the mutual information. So in other words, if you are, if you are studying a CFT, whose lowest scaling dimension is, an, is a fermion, then what they discover is that when you consider the mutual information of spheres, uh, that's what I might be that. So when you consider the mutual information of spheres for such a theory, then you will have this structure where you have this very precise coefficient. But what I found interesting from this formula is that first, what I probably I didn't emphasize, but just by looking at the way the power law decay of the mutual information, you are able to, to know what is the scaling dimension of this operator from reading this. But also by looking at the structure like the dependence on the normals and the, and, and the unit vector that join the centers here, by looking at the structure of this coefficient, then you will be able to uh, conclude that the operator associated to this contribution is a fermion and so on. So they did it also for vector fields, for tensors and so on. So they have all this tensor structure that will tell you something about the spin, which I think is very interesting. Okay, so, uh, uh, and as you can guess, uh, we're going, we're, we're precisely going to use this type of formulas to learn something about the M. But before that, I have to go a little bit uh, step further and show you another result of mutual information in general, uh, which is this, uh, which is this improved expansion. You, you can interpret it as an improved expansion uh, with respect to the one proposed by Cardi. Uh, so the idea of Longo here, uh, in the case of, in the particular case of spheres, is that maybe you can just choose, uh, you can use the same expansion of Cardi uh, for the region A, but integrate it out with some kernel function 
in the set of space-time points associated to the region A. And, that, and those are precisely the causal cone associated to A. So if you do this integral with some kernel, you impose conformal symmetry and so on, he showed that actually that singles out immediately the form of this kernel that you have to put, the form of the, yes, of the kernel here. And, and, and that happens to be completely given in terms of this conformal killing vector, which is also the same vector field that describes the modular flow associated to the sphere. So this is a nice and very concrete formula, which in some sense generalizes this formula. Okay, the, the next step is that, uh, uh, is that it is well known that this type of integral with this type of kernel, when you integrate it, you are basically resumming the contribution of a primary. If this is a primary operator, then with doing, by doing this integral, you are essentially resumming the contribution from that primary and all the descendants that, that come from that primary. Because this, the, the, this integral is, can be identified with the so-called OPE block. Essentially, uh, essentially, if you consider an, an ordinary OPE of space-time separated operators, then uh, using the OPE, you will get some coefficients. But the contribution of each intermediate operator will come, can be resumed, and it will come in the form of this OPE object, which depends on these two points. Okay, this is one thing. The other thing is that, as I said before, the mutual information is nothing but the correlation function of these two is operators. And when you consider correlation function of two of these OPE blocks, then you immediately obtain this conformal block, which was the object that naturally appears in the four point, for example, in the expansion of the four point function. Okay, so in summary, what Long proposed is that, uh, that the mutual information has an expansion in terms of conformal blocks, but where these conformal blocks are associated to primaries of the replica theory. And that's the, the thing that make it uh, a little bit more complicated than you would like, to, you would like it to be. And these coefficients actually can be computed again by taking the long distance limit of this of this coefficient. So, and, and I will try to describe how how you could go about doing this. Uh, okay. So now let let's go back to the problem of the Emmy and trying to bootstrap the Emmy or understand whether or not this Emmy could be described by some concrete CFT or even by some limit of CFTs. So, uh, and of course, since we learned what to do, uh, as, as we learned just. Uh, uh, a, few, a few minutes ago, then we will just consider the case of the spheres and put them far away using our concrete formula. And what we found is this result. We get something that goes like the volume of the spheres with some power and some tensor structure that have exactly this form. And if you can recognize this was exactly the dependence that comes from a fermion field. And then by looking at the way this decays with the distance, you can discover that actually that fermionic field is a free fermion. So essentially at long distances, you can see that the Emmy necessarily contains a free fermion. So this is the conclusion. And maybe that explains why the, the very central charges were, were more or less similar. Okay, but, uh, but that doesn't mean that the two theories coincide at long, at long distances because I'm here just computing the case for spheres. So, so we, will, we, we will ask that question in a bit. Or, um, and, and actually the Emmy not, not just tells you that, but also tells you that the geometric dependence on the region, it just comes with the volume of the region. So here, this constant is independent of the geometry and all the dependence on the geometry comes in the form of the volume of the region. So this, this in, in the particular case of the sphere, of course, uh, sorry, let me see if I, no, I didn't wrote it. Okay, I didn't wrote it explicitly, but the point is that this, the, the formula that you obtain is actually valid even for regions that are not the spheres, the one that we obtain for the, for the Emmy. So we have already a prediction if we, if we want to compare this with the free fermion, we have a prediction of how should depend geometrically the, the mutual information of a free fermion. Okay, so um, yes, that's, that's true. So, so now let us try to study uh, or, or, or just to ask the question whether at long distance, actually the Emmy is identically equal to the free fermion or not, uh, because that seems to be something that we can answer or ask ask and answer easily. So, uh, and for that, again, we use this formula of special that, uh, that computes entropies in terms of correlators of free fermions. This is easy, can be put in the lattice. And so uh, combining this to get the mutual information and put it in situations in which the regions are far away. Actually, there are more efficient formulas, but they are long and then I just ignored to put them in, the, in this presentation. But the point is that then, then what you can try to do is by studying different geometries, and, and put these ansatz, the answer that comes from the Emmy with some particular coefficient, see whether or not the, the, the in general, you will get a function that will depend on the, on the geometries, but whether or not such a function is just a constant for the free fermion. That, that will answer the, the, the question I'm posing at this moment. 
Uh, okay, sorry, um, I don't remember. Yeah, okay. So, uh, so I mean, at least to, to my surprise, what we found is that when we consider a squares, perfect squares, actually the coefficient here is essentially identical to the one of the sphere. So it's, it's like the, the sensitivity on the geometry for the, for the free fermion is actually not as strong as you could have imagined. But as soon as you start deforming the spheres, like proposing this formula, you start deforming the, sorry, the squares and make it longer and longer, then the coefficients you find are, are, are more and more different than the one of the sphere. So I, I, I made the plot here to make it more, more explicit. Uh, so again, what, what I have done is just to study the EMI at long distances and comparing to the expectation from the CFT for this particular conformal dimensions that I, that I described for you. What we found then is the coefficient that this thing must have, at least a very explicit coefficient that, that I wrote it here for you. And then I tried to see if this formula agrees for the free fermion. Now for arbitrary regions, because the formula we got from the M is for arbitrary regions, okay? And then we did a numerical calculation and what we found is that this, this parameter that appear here actually depends on the geometry, not just, at, not just through the products of volumes, but also through some function that depends on the explicit geometry. So as I said, even though for squares, we basically get one, as soon as we start deforming the squares and make it thinner and thinner, we get the, the coefficient is changing. So, so, so to conclude, what, what we obtain from here is that even though for spheres, we have an identical formula for the EMI as well as for the fermion, in detail, the, the way it depends on the, on the geometry is not the same. So the two theories do, do not agree exactly at long distances. And that turns out to be a problem for our search of finding a CFT whose mutual information is the one of the M. And, uh, and I hope to be able to explain more, I mean, to, to explain this problem now. <clears throat> okay, so the idea is the following. So far, uh, we have found that the mutual information contains a free fermion, just from the, from the things I mentioned to you, and that, or, or, or has a fermion whose correlation function is identical to the one of a free fermion. And then just because, just because the, the two point function of this field is, is, is the one of a free theory, then immediately implies that this theory cannot be interacting with any other of the fields of the theory. Yeah. No, only higher, higher than two, yes. I mean, the, the, the D equal two, I, we already solved it, let's say, yes. So this is, <laughs> we already solved it. Okay, so the Hilbert space factorizes, and then at the level of the mutual information, what we have is that we also have some kind of factorization. So, so we will have that the mutual information of the ME will necessarily agree with the mutual information of the fermion, pre-fermion, plus anything else that could be making the ME. So. Yeah, I didn't follow that. What, uh, why does it factorize? Sorry? So just because it's a free theory. You, you, just because it's a free theory and that cannot be correlated with anything, any other field in the theory. I think that's correct. Okay, I think you're using, you're using something about. I mean, there is a line, yeah, kind of a line argument that. I mean, you have, you're saying you just have a free fermion operator. So yeah. That means you have to have you have to have a free field theory, a free CFT. No, 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 no. no. The, the, the CFT, the CFT is not necessarily free, but it has a free a free sector that contains that fermion. Yeah, right. That, that that's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. So this theory is something else. It can be interacting, but it cannot interact with the fermion because that fermion is field. So this is this is kind of the separation I'm mentioning here. Okay. I, maybe maybe I can I can show you the arguments that, that's a little bit uh, that I kind of have, but okay. So so let's believe this this type of decoupling, the coupling at the level of the theories, at the level of the hero space, and at the level of the mutual informations. Okay, if this is the case, then you can immediately see that the at long distance the mutual information this this coefficient basically tells you the dependence on the geometry of the mutual information long distances. Uh, and here I'm using the formula for scalars just because. It's easier to write down and, and nothing depends on the spin, what I'm gonna say now. But the point is that the, the coefficient that appear here in front of the mutual information depends on the two point function of the fermion field or the skeleton, see the fermion field and the one that has been evolved, uh, has been evolved with the modular flow, with the modular, uh, yes. With, yeah, with the modular operator of the theory, okay? And this is just uh, so some integral, some procedure that you can do, but that, involves the two-point function of the field and the one that has been uh, evolved modularly. 
And what happens is that uh, because any, any, anything that doesn't involve directly the free fermion cannot affect the modular evolution of the free fermion here. Since we have a free fermion, then basically the density operator also factorizes in, a, in the piece that depends or that involves only uh, fermionic fields and everything else. And therefore that means that this coefficient for a theory that has this decoupling uh, property necessarily should agree with the one of the free fermion. So notice that this is the coefficient for the putative Emmy model that can have, an, uh, can have many other operators. But since the coefficient here, it, it, it depends only on the two point function of the fermion field and, and the one about modularly, it can only depend on the Fermi on the free sector. And therefore it should agree with the Emmy. But what we have found and what I have just told you is that this doesn't happen, at least in D larger than two. So this is not true. And therefore uh, we conclude that the Emmy cannot be a CFT. But everything depends on this decoupling. Okay. Okay, if, if you believe this argument, then uh, at this point, the result seems to be negative. Okay, I, I told you I motivated this Emmy model. We were trying to explore and trying to find the CFT that was described, being described by the Emmy model. And we found that the answer was negative, that there is no CFT. However, this doesn't necessarily answer the question of whether there is some kind of family or one parameter family of CFTs that in certain asymptotic limit, it could agree or it could reproduce the Emmy model. This uh, in some sense is not necessarily solved. Uh, and, and I believe the subtlety is just due to the possible discontinuity in this argument and in the argument of how, of how a theory that is decoupled uh, affect the modular evolution of psi. So if this decoupling, if, if for instance, the decoupling is governed by some parameter and then we are taking just the free limit parameter, then it might, it might happen that that limit is, is, is discontinuous. And maybe if, if, if you have any finite but very little coupling, maybe the, this dependence on the geometry is not exactly identical to the one of the free fermion, let's say. Uh, and because of that, then it would be interesting to have an independent argument that does not involve the chain dependence, but involves something more universal. And that's why we come back to the previous, to the, to the type of arguments that I was describing to you that involves the spheres. And for that, uh, I'm, I'm just simply going to use this formula that I wrote before to you to try to understand what are the operators that are actually making the Emmy, at least for the case of the spheres, because the spheres doesn't have this problem of the modular flow. Uh, yeah, so this is just the formula that, uh, of the Emmy in the case of the spheres. And this is what I already described for you that happen at long distances. And even though I, I didn't tell you explicitly, but actually the type of, op I mean, I, I told you that long distances, this contribution comes from a free fermion. But if you ask me exactly, What's, what's the type of operate, how this free fermion appear in the expansion of the twist operator? The way it appears is through a, this kind of current, a current that is made out of two fermions. If you remember, we only keep replica operators that, uh, that are defined on two different copies of the CFT. So basically you need two free fermions in different copies to construct this current. And this current is the one responsible for this long distance uh, decay, okay? Uh, and I'm saying this because basically what, what we have said so far is that the leading piece of the Emmy necessarily comes from the replica operator that is made out of two fermions and that is a spin one operator, which is conserved and has this scaling dimension. So by identifying this, I know immediately that in this expansion, I should have not, not only the one over the distance to some power, but the whole conformal block associated to this primary operator, primary replica operator. Okay, so what I'm saying here is, I'm assuming that the Emmy corresponds to a CFT and therefore it must be possible to expand it in terms of conformal blocks of replica primaries. I told you before that when, I, when we took the long distance limit, we were able to identify one such primary. Then what I'm just simply doing is to separate from this expansion, the primary contribution that I know. And then not just the primary, but all the descendants. And so I, I subtract completely the conformal block. So I know this, the Emmy should have this piece. And then what I wonder now is what happens with the rest? I know it has this current, but then what other operators will appear in the expansion of the Emmy? Uh, we can ask this question because the formula of the Emmy is so simple that I can actually evaluate it exactly. I can just uh, do some complicated integrals, but I can, I can get a concrete formula for that. And what was surprising to us is that when you do the explicit computation, what you find is that the Emmy is just given by a single term. And that single term is precisely the conformal block associated 
to this free current, free fermionic current. So, so in this expansion, what we are saying is that if the ME corresponds to a CFT, then it must be that all the contributions from all the other possible replica operators are such that they cancel completely and leave only the contribution of the, of, of the free current. And that is kind of miraculous if, if, if something like that could happen, okay? So the rest of the argument is just to show that actually this doesn't happen. Um, okay, um, I think I could, I could finish in a few minutes. Uh, how do we do that? Uh, the idea is to, again, to use the decoupling argument, but not at the level of the modular flow, but just at the level of the mutual informations. So we, so we knew from the previous discussions that the ME contains a free fermion and something else. Um, so, uh, so, so we try to analyze each of these pieces. So for example, here, I just write the expansion in terms of conformal blocks that this free fermion should have. And I also write the expansion that any, the rest of the theory can have. So there are some conformal blocks that I don't know exactly, but, but I can write down this kind of expansion. And now, uh, however, it, it, one can compute what is the next operator that will contribute to the mutual information for the free fermion. So we know what is the next uh, operator of lowest scaling dimension that can contribute. So we can write explicitly or study this piece. And then I will, I will give you the name. I will just call it Delta I Psi. This will be the, the first correction to this conformal block for the free fermion. And then what must happen if I want that the ME uh, is actually consistent with having the sum of this two contribution is that the leading contribution coming from the fermion expansion should exactly cancel with the leading term appearing in the rest of the theory. So we need that perfect cancellation. So we just keep the first correction in both sides and they should somehow cancel. So we, we conclude that we should have something like this. Okay. Um, um, and, and, and you can uh, single out what type of operator will contribute using the symmetries of the theory and so on. And this is this complicated operator and compute the contribution of the free fermion and, and, and what is kind of interesting is that this contribution comes with a negative sign. And this is a good, this is a good sign, the fact that the, that the contribution is negative. Why? Because I know that the leading term of this, of this sector has to be positive. Then if the leading piece, if the subleading piece coming from the free fermion were also positive, we will immediately rule out the ME because the ME has to be larger than the one of the free fermion, okay? So, 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 so in this particular computation, what we found is actually that this piece, this, the next to leading order term uh, conformal block contribution from the free theory is actually negative. And, and therefore you can, you can potentially have this kind of cancellation. But what, what is interesting is that the only operator that could cancel this type of contribution is again, one, uh, a free operator. And that free operator, just by using the classification uh, presented by, by, by Cassini, Teste and Torova, then we find out that this has to be an elicity one operator with, uh, with completely anti-symmetric indices. So the number of indices must be D half and the, and the scaling dimension is D half as well. Uh, this means that this operator only exists in even dimensions. So we could immediately eliminate all the odd dimensions. Like they cannot correspond to a CFT because you will not have any possibility of canceling this term. Um, and using again, this, this decoupling argument, then we conclude that the ME is, uh, I mean, I mean now, now, now what, what we have discovered, we have that, we know that the ME contains a free fermion, but now because of the argument I just told you, uh, I know that I need also a uh, elicity one field operator, primary operator to be able to cancel the subleading term coming from the fermion. So essentially now I know that the ME contains a free fermion and elicity one operator, primary uh, free operator. And because they are free then, the mutual information is just a sum of contributions once again. Okay, and then this implies that you have an, in, an inequality of this form because the mutual information is necessarily positive. This quantity is positive, then you have this inequality. And to complete the argument, then what we do is to try to explore in the space of configurations, situations in which this inequality could be violated. If it could be violated, then something wrong went into this, like there is some inconsistency. And, and what we, I mean, and, and the only way in which we could find a violation was precisely going back to the extreme situation. Notice that all these expansions are being obtained in the long distance regime when we separate regions and we have all this OPE. But once we have this separation and we have this inequality, this inequality should hold anywhere for any, for any distance. And then when we consider a situation like this, what we found is that the coefficient of the area divergence 
does not obey this the inequality that will follow from the mutual information, but is violated basically for all dimensions up to d equals six. Uh, we didn't go farther because uh, then we needed to keep going because all this inequality is satisfied after d equals six. Let's say. So you needed to subtract this uh, helicity one. I mean, you could have made the same argument just yeah. the helicity one, right? I mean. But but maybe yeah. So okay okay. In, let, this let, limit, in this limit. In in which limit? Well, I just already in this level, I R A B has to be positive, right? Yes. So can't you explore that in the limit where two circles are? Uh, but, but I don't know what is I R. Ah, you mean by subtracting the contributions yeah, of this? Forget the H one. I mean, I, I'm just wondering how important it was that you that you noticed this helicity one field. Uh, it was important to, for the decoupling term for the decoupling argument. So the, so what I, what, what I mean is the fact that the mutual information factorizes, otherwise it will not factorize because it might be coupled to the rest of the theory and then it's just not just the mutual information of each field. Yeah, I guess I'm just, like, I feel like you could have made the argument you're making now at, before you talked about the Hobbesity one. And maybe it's, a, maybe you can't see a violation, but. That's what I'm asking. Uh, oh, you, you, you mean, yeah, yes, no. The, yeah. I, this, that, that's a very good point. Yeah, at this level, you mean at this level yeah, you have yeah, yeah. an inequality, and and that's what is surprising about the Emmy that is very hard to rule it out. Mm -hmm. So if, if we if we explore this this same argument, but only for the leading term, it turns out that it, it doesn't violate. It's fine. Okay. So yes, it's fine. This is larger than this. So I actually need this to get a violation because this inequality is already done. So it seems like the Emmy somehow wants to survive, but uh, there are some things that don't quite work. So, so the conclusion is that uh, even though I didn't, I, I didn't, uh, yes. So going back to the very, very, very motivation, the conclusion is that uh, this mapping between concrete solutions or explicit realizations of the space of functionals and CFTs might not, uh, might not exist. That's also one possibility. But maybe the other possibility is that just we do not know yet all the, all the properties that the mutual information should satisfy. And then this could be an evidence that maybe we need to keep searching for properties like fundamental properties that are mutual information satisfy such that uh, what's happening is that uh, extensivity necessarily is, is violating one of those properties. And therefore it shouldn't be to begin with in the space of, of allowed functionals or entropy functionals. So this is, this is, the, this is kind of the interesting result of doing this, this exercise. Oh, it's not a result, it's a possibility because in principle, this was just a proposal. Maybe we can describe the CFT using mutual information, but maybe, maybe that's not possible. This is just the wrong question. But if it is the right question, then maybe this is pointing towards the incompleteness of the, of the set of inequalities that are mutual information or, or fundamental properties that are mutual information should follow. Okay, so uh, as I said, uh, what we saw in this, in this work is that the ME is a solution which satisfies all known axioms of the mutual information, uh, but it doesn't correspond to a CFT or a limit of CFT in higher dimensions, even though it has a positive outcome for D equal two, it actually corresponds to a, to a real CFT. So whatever this constraint exists, maybe it depends on the space-time dimension such that it, that it cannot rule out the D equal two case, let's say. Uh, so as I said, this may be the, the, the set of axioms that the mutual information is incomplete. And, and I have been always curious about this, this, this inequality because maybe you just need to axiomatize this inequality that write it down in terms of mutual information if that's if something like that is possible. And maybe what's happening is that we are violating somehow this inequality. Finally, um, um, I, think, I think going back to the, to the theme of the workshop, Maybe uh, this, exp I mean, I found very powerful the expansion of the mutual information because this gives us like a way to bootstrap the theory. If you just understand very well the mutual information for spheres, you can, you, you, you might be able to do some inversion and find all the replica operators that contribute to them. Of course, it will be better if, this, if these operators were not replica operators, but actually uh, operators that exist in the original CFT, that would be a much better expansion. But this is the expansion that uh, seems uh, that, that we have. So it would be either interesting to rewrite it in terms of actual CFT operators or, uh, or, or just to study at this level, but maybe learn something about holography by considering the holographic dual to these objects. I think that would be very interesting, uh, just uh, based on the, on the papers by Bartek and company and Jan and company. Uh, there might be some nice holographic dual for the conformer blocks, 
of these replica theories. Um, uh, I don't know yet, but uh, that would be interesting to explore. Um, and finally, by, after many conversations with Bartek, who told me about his paper, very, very nice paper, it, it, it seems that maybe the extensivity is somehow related to having, at, at least holographically, having a purely EPR interpretation of the entanglement entropies. So, 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 so maybe putting this constraint, E3 equal to zero, is inconsistent with CFT because somehow it's just telling you that your CFT can only have bipartite entanglement or something like that. And that might be just the reason, like you might, you might put an action that says like, okay, you, you must have some sort of high apartheid entropy or something or something like that. But anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Question for Cesar. Yeah, um, so when you say M is not the limit of a CFT, so can you rule out, for instance, the massive case can be a massive theory? No, 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 because everything here is in the context of CFTs. I mean, the M itself was obtained from assuming conformal invariance. If, but can you suppose, uh, so you, can you exclude that it's not conformal? Maybe uh, that, that, that's yeah, a very that's... interesting question, and uh, and I don't know the answer. I mean, can you can you also obtain a functional form for the mutual information if you don't impose conformal invariance? That I don't know. Yeah, but that would be very interesting. That would be like the next thing. Maybe there is an ME for ordinary QFTs, like for massive QFTs, an but, ME like form. I will not have this form. But uh, I mean, probably. But you need something like uh, locality, this kind of thing, no? I don't know. Uh, do you expect maybe non-locality, very strange uh, QFT, in order to have Amy? In order to obtain what? The, uh, no, because the... you are excluded. You are saying Amy is not a CFT. Yes. But uh, is it still a local quantum field theory? Maybe it's not local. Maybe. Ah, I see. I see. I see. I see. Well, there is some other exotic kind of theories. Yeah, that yeah. Which kind of uh, uh, craziness? Ah, uh, I see. I see. I have <laughs> no idea about expect? that, but. But maybe, but maybe there is some like I don't know, non-local or non-unitary theory for which the ME is the entanglement entropy, yeah, or the mutual information. I mean, and sorry, last question. Uh, you don't yeah. expect because for the equal two, it's very under control, no? Yes. So do you expect some I don't know, maybe some compactification radius that you can introduce in order to explore this limit? Maybe you can introduce an extra dimension but compactify that you can shrink to. Oh, the, I see. I see. I see. I reduce it to two dimensions. Yes, to, to move continuous way from two dimensions somehow. I see. I mean, the, the formula, the, the ME formula is very simple in arbitrary dimensions. So that's, you, you mean to explore the, the, the theories itself. Like, I mean, let, let, let me see if I, if I understand. So what, what you're saying is that just consider certain CFTs in higher dimensions, just compactify somehow and reduce it to a two-dimensional field theory. And maybe that, that type of theory does not necessarily, I mean, it will not gonna be conformal, but maybe in that way you can find some, some kind of formula which is extensive or something like that. Yeah, that, that, that's very interesting. I, ha, I don't think nobody have done anything with, yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to make a comment and not a question, which is that it's important to remember that we're talking about uh, looking for the, I mean, Tom made this comment already, that we're talking about the vacuum of some theory and not the whole theory. Yes. So, um, so in some sense, you could just make up a, a state which has your desired properties and say, I'm going to declare it to be the vacuum of something. And uh, so I think that's a better perspective on your question, which is then does that such a theory have a chance of being a local theory? That's like a way of phrasing this question maybe better. Yeah. Oh. Other questions? All right, if not, let's uh, thank Cesar again.